Might be interested, and I said, "Oh yeah, I'd definitely be interested." Theater was kind of an application for me. Um, so yes, I was very interested. So that began some conversations, and then as I talked to her, uh, she started telling me that, "Oh, well, I got a little more money, and I put I applied for a grant from here and there." And then, all told, she ended up raising over a hundred thousand dollars, and and still made this movie on the sheet. Matthew Troy um, was the director, and he wrote the script. And he was in his senior year, well, he started as a junior, but in his senior year at Tisch School in New York City um, to become a, a videographer. And he's now in the business. I mean, this was 2009, 2008, 2009. Matthew was uh, back and forth in his senior year with all kinds of projects, and he'd come to town with a test script, and, and uh, I read for him here in the firehouse, he and Donna, and a couple of us read different parts, and, and then Matthew would be told the script wasn't quite right, he had to rework it, and, and then I was told they want you to read again, and so over the course of you know, six months or so, I think I read three or four times. And then finally Donna got the money she needed. And Matthew, I remember telling me um, when he was in school and he was kind of talking about this project with his professors, one of them said, you know, never try to make a period movie for less than $2 million, because it, <laughs> it can't be done. <laughs> so this one was done for $100,000. And if you, how many people have never seen the movie? <laughs> well, because sort of, uh, I'm in. In any case, uh, I, I wanted to give Donna McCullough her props. Uh, she's recovering from rotator cuff surgery and is kind of an expat now. She's in town, but living. Uh, half a year on the Isle of Rhodes. So, good for her. I'm gonna launch into some of the things that I, information I have here. And I, I wanna say that uh, as far as my sources, many of these sources are on our own website. Some of the information I just, I was able to glean right off of our website. Other information I, I Found online, um, this is kind of just a general discussion about slavery, slavery in the colonies, slavery in Connecticut, and slavery in Hebrew. So, slavery, some historic information. Was the slavery that developed in the New World fundamentally different? from the kinds of servitude found in classical antiquity or in other societies. In one respect, New World slavery clearly was not unique. Slavery everywhere permitted cruelty and abuse. In the ancient India, Saxon England, ancient China, a master might mistreat or even kill a slave with impunity. Slavery in the classical and early medieval worlds was not based on racial distinction. Racial slavery originated during the Middle Ages, when Christian and Muslim increasingly began to recruit slaves from the East, North, Central, and West Africa. As late as the 15th century, slavery did not automatically mean black slavery. Many slaves came from the Crimea, the Balkans, and the steppes of Western Asia. But after 1453, when the Ottoman Turks captured Constantinople, the capital of Eastern Christendom, Christian slave traders grew increasingly upon captive black Muslims, which were also, of course, known as Moors, and upon slaves purchased on the West African coast or transported across the Sahara Desert. The ancient world did not necessarily regard slavery as permanent, as freeing slaves was common, and former slaves carried little stigma from their previous status. The first European settlers of the colonies enslaved conquered natives, 
This was not an unknown practice to Native Americans, as they were known to keep slaves from conquered tribes long before Europeans arrived. Most were women and children who eventually assimilated into their new tribes, escaped, or were traded back to their original tribes. Eventually, Africans became the preferred property, being deemed less likely to run away. There weren't tribes that they could run to, and they certainly couldn't get across the ocean. They didn't even know where they were. And they were also considered to be harder workers than Native Americans. Some of the major differences between slavery in the New World and slavery in ancient and medieval times. First, it seems from the Middle Ages on, Africans were considered a subspecies. By comparison, they appeared primitive in clothing, technology, culture, and religion. The advanced African cultures were largely unknown to Europeans at the time. And clearly, just as they did with Native Americans, the European settlers underestimated the rich and complex culture of Africans. And that's really complex cultures. So certainly it's not one African culture. Their narrow view of the world gave them justification to minimize, dominate, enslave, torture, and even kill those who were so different from themselves. Second, slavery in the Americas became directly tied to a for-profit economy. For the British colonies, this was most prevalent in the southern states, especially after the Revolution. Although Connecticut had several plantations, one in Salem, Lebanon, Pomfret, uh, for the most part, owning slaves in the northern colonies and eventually northern states like Connecticut was a symbol of affluence and or status and was by no means critical to the economy as it was in the South. The film Testimonies of a Quiet New England Town tells the true story of Hebron Connecticut slaves the Peters family. Many pre- and post-revolution Connecticut preachers, lawyers, and wealthy merchants owned slaves. This was also common in, at the time in England. Hebron's own Reverend Samuel Peters was a prominent member of Connecticut's clergy, born in 1735 into a large Hebron family. He was educated at Yale. He traveled to England, as was required, to be ordained as an Episcopal priest. Upon his return in 1759, he became something of a gentleman farmer, mostly on East Street, incidentally. In addition, of course, to his church responsibilities, he acquired slaves to assist in his household duties, among them Caesar and his wife, Lois, who, like most slaves of the time, or at least many slaves of the time, were given their master's surnames. Hebron, of course, was founded in 1704 and incorporated as a Puritan community in 1708. Puritans became known, as I'm sure most of you know, as Congregationalists, and their dislike, even hatred, towards the King of England is well documented. During a time of heated disagreement among church members in 1735, the year Samuel Peters was born, 20 families, including the Peters family, broke away from the Congregationalist Church and formed an Anglican or Episcopal parish. This is important because as part of Samuel's ordination into the Episcopal priesthood, he was required to swear an oath of support to the King of England. Being loyal to his oath, would cause the Reverend Peters great conflict in the years to come and greatly impact his slaves. A little bit about slavery in Connecticut and Hebrew. Northern slaves were expected to do household chores of their masters. And typically, 
lived in their master's homes. As I mentioned, the web house. Um, often the slaves lived in the attic or the basement. In the South, a small percentage of slaves tended to their master's households. For the most part, these were households belonging to a very few wealthy white landowners who additionally owned scores, even hundreds, of Africans. Free labor that drove the Southern economy. In some Southern states during the 18th and 19th century, the slaves outnumbered the whites. According to the first census taken by the United States in 1790, Connecticut had about 238,000 people, free people, and about 2,800 slaves, or a bit more than 1% of the population. Hebron's population was 2,234, with approximately 20 slaves, about 1% of the population. South Carolina, where the Peters family were bound for before being rescued by Hebron citizens, had a free white population of about 250,000, and a slave population in 1790 listed at 107,000. Census numbers of the time are anything but exact, and there's some question as to at what age was the slave actually counted, or a black African actually counted into the census. And it may have been 12, it may have been 10, so there's some discrepancy. It's likely that there were, there were more than 20 slaves in Hebron, uh, some being slave children. We don't know for sure. Uh, it seems that in the mid-1770s, Connecticut's slave population topped out at more than 5,000, while free people numbered less than 200,000. How was it that the slave population in Connecticut and all of the northern colonies began such a steady and dramatic drop, while just the opposite was happening in the southern colonies? Surely, the fact that Southern slaveholders were becoming wealthy beyond their imaginations played a large part. By accident of soil and climate conditions, the Southern economy boomed while the North began to trend toward manufacturing. Connecticut native Eli Whitney gave this fact an enormous boost at the end of the century with the invention of the cotton gin. Some of the North began to speak out against slavery calling it unchristian. It should be noted that Connecticut passed the Gradual Emancipation Act in 1784, freeing children born to slaves after that date once they reached adulthood. Now my understanding is that that act was amended and changed slightly as they approached, uh, as the years went on, but for the most part, that was fairly advanced for the time. Further, the 1790 census from Massachusetts lists no slaves being owned in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And they had been the largest slave holding colony uh, through most of the colonial times. Of course, Northerners profited greatly from the slave trade as they built, owned, and captained the slave ships. In addition, the North became dependent on Southern crops, especially at that time, wheat, sugar, and tobacco. So even as the Northern colonies, eventually states like Connecticut, had a declining slave population, their economic interests and beliefs that Africans were not in fact equal to whites prevented them from bringing serious pressure on the South to end or abolish slavery. Finally, one of the least taught and to my mind, greatest and most remarkable differences between Hebron, Connecticut, Northern slaves in general, and the plantation slaves of the South was literacy. In the North, slaves were taught to read 
by their educated masters, especially clergy members. Somewhat self-serving. It was assumed they would be converted to Christianity once they could read, and they were taught to read so they could read the Bible. Samuel Peters taught Caesar to read. It's unlikely that he taught Lois, but Caesar may have. Not only was this allowed, literate northern slaves were encouraged to teach other slaves to read and write. In the South, <clears throat> laws were enacted very early on to punish whites who taught Africans to read and write. Stiff fines and even jail time were imposed for violators. I identical uh, punishment existed for Africans with one exception. They were whipped in addition to being fined and jailed. Uh, in 1740, 39 lashes was required in the state of Virginia if you caught a slave teaching someone to write, not read and write. Well, let's get back to Caesar and Lois. By 1789, 87 rather, the time the film takes place, Hebron's Reverend Peters, loyalist stance, had caused him great hardship. The revolution was over and he picked the wrong side. This is what, you would, what we also refer to as a, as a Tory. Uh, and it was very, very common. The Revolutionary War was much more of a civil war than we were ever taught in school. In fact, there were battles that happened in the South where the only British were the officers. And it really was family against family, cousin against cousin. Uh, but that's not the way we were taught. And here in, in Hebrew, Connecticut, there were plenty of loyalists, plenty of Tories. And eventually, when the war ended, they scampered off to, in, uh, to, to Canada, where they founded Hebron. Canada. It's a town that exists, and if you look at the records, you'll find all kinds of last names that are similar to the last names of those who were living in Hebrew at the time. In fact, if Samuel was forced to flee to England in 1774, having nearly lost his life to the Sons of Liberty. He was once dragged from his home at night by an enraged gang of these patriots, some say numbering as many as 300 men. They accused the Reverend of being a British spy and would have likely killed him had not the Congregationalist minister, Benjamin Pomeroy, stopped them. Soon after, Peters fled, leaving his family and slaves to fend for themselves. Caesar and Lois had two children at the time, and continued to live and work within the Peters household. Later, and we're not sure exactly when, they were forced to leave the property. Where they lived after that is not known. We really don't have records. Uh, but Caesar continued to tend to his master's farm for more than a dozen years. By 1787, Caesar and Lois had six more children. So they were a family of 10. And it's assumed, I, I assume, that they were, they were all still in Hebron and living amongst Hebronites. In the meantime, during these 12 years, early on actually, Governor Trump <laughs> from Lebanon confiscated the Reverend's farmland and leased it to patriots to grow crops, some of which were used to feed Washington's troops. To add more insult to injury, Trumbull continued to tax Samuel's property, depleting his estate to the point that he wrote to his nephew and attorney, Nathaniel Mann, ordering Mann to sell his assets to pay his debts. It's unclear if the Reverend meant to include the sale of his slaves at this time. In a later correspondence, Peter states that he did not mean to include Caesar and his family, and in fact intended to grant them their freedom. 
What is clear is that man arranged to have Caesar and Lois sold in South Carolina to a South Carolina slave owner, a slaveholder, the attempt of one David Pryor to re retrieve his new slaves is our story. The story of an attempted abduction and the response of Hebron's citizenry to prevent it. The narrow European and eventually American view of black Africans as a subspecies of whites was clearly embraced by educated and prosperous northern whites of the period. That same attitude, coupled with an economy built and sustained by the free labor of Africans, allowed the roots of slavery to put a stranglehold in both the North and the South. What prompted the people of Hebron to take such a stand to perpetuate a, a fraud, to lie in court, which you see in the movie, we don't know. Not only did Hebron's officials save their friends from an uncertain future, the family most likely would have been split up at auction, but the people of Hebron gave depositions to the state of to have Caesar and Lois emancipated within two years. Did Caesar, Lois, and their children change the attitudes of their neighbors by living among them for a dozen years? We can't know for sure. We do have records of two celebrations held following their rescue in Norwich. One on the return trip about halfway home, and one in Hebron. The rescuers submitted sizable bills to the Hebron selectmen for food and drink. The selectmen agreed to pay for the food. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy the film. Look for your friends and neighbors. Afterwards, I'll share a bit more about a Hebron woman who was a key figure in the Lincoln administration and during the Reconstruction. And I'll share some, I'll be happy to answer questions about the film, about what I've talked about tonight. And I'll share some, I think, amusing anecdotes about the film itself. So without further ado, actually, before you hit that one, Adam, let me get this one, then when it's, totally dark, I won't fall down. <laughs> Go ahead. is now in session. Order. Order. Constable, please present the complaint to the court. The complaint of the plaintiff Elijah Graves, that the accused Caesar Peters, on the night after the 24th of September, did feloniously steal and carry off from my house the following articles. One broadcloth vest with metal buttons, one pair of corduroy breeches, one corduroy vest, one pair of flower silver knee buckles, and for the recovery thereof with just cost, the plaintiff brings this suit. 
Will the defendants please rise? Caesar, Lois, and Theodorus Peters are hereby summoned on the charges of theft of clothing from the town tailor, Mr. Elijah Graves of Hebron. On this said 27th day of September, 1787. How do you plead? Guilty. Guilty. Is everyone at home right now? They're still slaves, Patience. I believe they're being taken to South Carolina in the morning. Good evening, Elijah. Is it? Well, you, you are the justice of the peace. Certainly there is some law, something you can do. Nathaniel Mann has documents for their sale. He is in every legal right. I have no cause to stop him. But that is why I am here. Every legal right. If you had seen how they were treated like animals, Elihu, beaten and Patience, shackled. Let us hear what Justice Marvin has to say. I have been told that you were not at militia training with the rest of the men from town. How is that of any consequence? If you were not at the training, then surely you must have witnessed the seizure of your neighbors. But you did not go over to protest. I could barely walk, Elihu. I can see that. What is it? What is the matter? I am just trying to make sense of this afternoon. I was not there. I was there. I walked outside when I heard the screams. <laughs> Patience, what did you give Caesar and Lois? Food and clothing. Caesar and Lois are in possession of clothing taken from your house. Would you be willing to testify to that in court? James! Oh, how did you escape? Oh, is your family here too? No. no. James, where is your family? They've been taken to Norwich, to the shipyards, they said. They are not far. Constable. Yes, sir. Draft a warrant for the arrest of Caesar and Lois Peters for the theft of clothing from Elijah Graves. What? No, we would never steal anything. Please, draft a warrant and return Caesar and his family back here tonight. Don't you see? They cannot leave if they are accused of a crime. They must stand trial here. But we will never steal anything, and you know that. James, you must trust me. Patience never gave your family anything. Do you understand? Do you think they'll catch them in time? How has this come to be, Patience? I cannot lie in court. 
Elijah. No, Patience. I am a simple man who has always minded his own business. And now this. Nathaniel Mann has done nothing wrong to us and nothing illegal. Just because it is not illegal does not make it right. Do not lecture me. Caesar and Lois are our neighbors. They're our friends, Elijah. my home. Is your husband at home? Please leave. Patience. Leave us alone. Nathaniel, what do you want from me? Simple. For all of this to go away. Do you think I have the power to make that happen? I do not appreciate other people meddling in my affairs, Elijah. My uncle asked me to oversee the sale of his property, and that includes his slaves, so I did as I was asked. Listen, Elijah, I know you're up to no good. Those clothes were charity, and you know it. You saw it just as I did. Explain to me why Caesar and Lois were never freed when your Tory of an uncle ran off to his beloved England. This is no one's business but my own. I came here to offer a warning, Elijah. You are a quiet neighbor and a fine tailor, but you are a liar. And I see no reason not to bring this, this corrupt trial to the attention of the superior courts. You want to be a patriot? Do not dare turn a blind eye to the law. Guilty. Guilty. What is wrong, your honor? Not enough time to rehearse their lines? Dr. Mann, you would be so kind as to keep order in my courtroom. Guilty, sir. Very well. Let it be stated for the record that all three defendants plead guilty to the charges of theft. As for the consequences, Mr. Elijah Graves, would you please step forward? Mr. Graves, would you state for the court the value of the stolen items? Knee buckles are worth three shillings. A vest, slightly worn and stained, two shillings, six pence. Three for the breeches and the coat. Six shillings for the coat. Thank you, Mr. Graves. You may step down. I have 15 shillings here. Allow me to pay for the clothes and we can all be on our way. Consider it an act of charity. Here, Elijah, take the money. Dr. Mann, please be seated. I find the defendants Guilty as charged. As to the fine, 
I'm setting the fine at 40 shillings for the crimes committed, 40 shillings each for damages, and a fee of seven pounds for the cost of this trial. 40 shillings each? And seven pounds entire? Good God, that is almost two years' wages. Very good point, Dr. Mann. Until the fines are paid in full, I recommend that the defendants will repay Mr. Elijah Graves with two years' service. Two years' service? You are being unrealistic, Your Honor. For stolen clothes? And you, you, Elijah, are a liar. You are all liars. Dr. Man. This clothing was never stolen. No crime was ever committed here. You make a mockery of this new nation's justice system. Dr. Man, you are out of order. No, no, Elihu, you are out of order. This would never would have happened under the king. Nathaniel Man, you traitor! You, you hypocrite! Oh, now. How dare you question the proceedings of this court? when you yourself should be convicted of assault. Is this true? Oh, lies about the clothes. <laughs> Did you brandish a weapon? She... They had no right to interfere. Constable, with take Dr. Mann into custody. No, no. You are a liar, liar. A liar and a scoundrel. No, oh. All of you. The fine stands as stated. With custody provided unto Elijah Graves until paid in full, should he accept these terms. Mr. Graves. I accept these terms. Good. This court is adjourned. Thank you. Better neighbor we never had. This doesn't make them free, Elihu. But at least they are safe for now.
It was filmed in six days in and around Hebron. Um, from Memorial Day. <clears throat> and boy, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> it really was. It, it was so different from you know, what we were, so many of us were used to doing. And Matthew came to town with all of his uh, Tisch School friends who all had their own little specialties. They were sound people and light people and camera people and uh, customers and so forth. And for the most part, they all lived in his mother's house for that time. Uh, I have several anecdotes, but I'll, I'll take the gun on this one. Um, I think there were as many as like 18 or 19 of them there. They had all just graduated from college, or not all of them, but you know, some were juniors, but uh, most of them were, had just graduated. And so they were full of vin and vinegar, staying up late and partying and so forth. Well, the Troy septic tank took it real bad. <laughs> real bad. And that wasn't the only one. In the very beginning of the movie, you may have noticed, um, some of you who, who may know him, um, Freddie Brehan. In the very beginning, when the slaves were, were taken out of their home, that's a, a building that Freddie has in his backyard, right on Route 66, that he built, that's historically accurate, and so forth. So, uh, the film was, that scene was, was shot there. And, you know, to set these things up, it's, it's mind-boggling like how much time it takes and so forth and how many people are involved. And, and so there were oh, probably 30 people on the set that day going back and forth, setting it up, waiting to try to get it right and so forth. And apparently the toilet in Freddie's house was running and nobody, these college kids, nobody said anything. <laughs> And Freddie wasn't home, he was at work. And then his wife came home. And so poor Terry had to deal with another septic tank. So there were, you know, casualties, two septic tanks. I'm going to share a little bit about a few of the people that were in it. Richard May, who played Caesar, he was uh, mid 40s, he came from New York. Matthew cast him, Matthew put an ad in something. Uh, he, he cast Richard. Richard was a, a mid 40s Harvard PhD in psychology who had his own private practice. <laughs> he dearly wished Caesar's character was more developed. <laughs> Believe me. And he was, he was just a hoop. Uh, Ethan Franks was about 24 years old. He was a professionally trained actor, and he stayed with me for the, for the week. A lot of them stayed at the, um, at, at the Troy house, a lot of the kids did. But Matthew, I mean, uh, Ethan stayed with me, so we, we had a good time. Um, and of course, it was me, a local with a car. <laughs> Patience Graves was played by Bianca Jamat. She was 25 years old at the time. A professional actor, singer, model, newlywed to a, a New York City firefighter. She was really a strong woman. She insisted that we go out together on a Saturday night, the, the four of us. Um, and she was asking about, well, where can we go? What can we, where can we? And I said something, somebody said something about, what's that? That place, the, the maple or the butterfly. And after what I thought was a perfectly awful description of the place, to try to, you know, and, uh, you know. <laughs> Bianca says, it's perfect. Let's go there. Let's go to butter, butterballs. A biker bar? That's what we want to do. <laughs> she, she, and that's where we ended up. Bianca. 
Before I share our Saturday night karaoke experience at Butterbucks, <laughs> I'd, I'd like to share something else. I, I mentioned that there was a, a woman from Hebrew who had a lot to do with reconstruction. And her name was Josephine Griffin, and her maiden name was White. She was born in Hebron in 1813. And this is from a uh, doctoral dissertation uh, about Josephine Griffin. On February 19, 1872, Washington, D.C. newspapers carried notices of the death of Mrs. Josephine S. Griffin. Griffin, it's Griffin. Well known in Washington as one of the leaders of the women's suffragette movement in this district, and more especially for her efforts in behalf of the destitute freedmen. According to the Star, a Washington newspaper, she was a woman of more than ordinary ability and was greatly esteemed by all who knew her. The Daily Morning Chronicle, in a rather exaggerated and thoroughly Victorian manner, described Mrs. Griffin as a woman of rare beauty of character, of uncommon executive capacity and judgment, and ever inspired by a beautiful and self-sacrificing charity. She had warm friends among the best men and women, eminent in character, influence, and position, and a host of devoted friends also amongst the poor and aged free people, to whom for years she has been a daily angel of mercy, an angel of mercy indeed. But her charity had been extended to a despised class former slaves, now freedmen. In spite of a generally unsympathetic public, she had persisted in her efforts to deal with the critical problems facing free Negroes in Washington during the post-Civil War period, attempting to ease the all-important transition from slavery to freedom. There's an article on our website. This document is on our website. This was an amazing woman. She knew it was going to be difficult beyond words to transition black African, now American slaves, to a free people. Thank you. For some individuals, some had been here about you know one generation, but many, many had been three, four, five, even six generations of slaves. People far removed from their ancestral culture. With few exceptions, the black culture or the African culture, the slave culture was only what the whites allowed it to be. Few of the whites who let slavery go on for so long wanted anything to do with the newly freed slaves. We don't believe in slavery, but we don't want them too close. After all, they're in fear of her. Just look at them. They don't really know how to be a female. They don't speak well. African Americans have been patching together a culture for themselves for just a bit more than 150 years. I happen to think it's pretty impressive. And I'm not too surprised that whites 
don't occupy a very high place in African American culture. And I'm also not surprised that white kids gravitate towards African American arts and culture. So, we walk into Butterballs <laughs> on a warm late May night, Saturday night, and it's karaoke night. Bianca listens to maybe two locals and says, okay, I'm going up. <laughs> and she proceeds to kill the whole place with a supreme hit. I mean, she just killed it. Richard smiles and says, my turn. He goes up and sings several British Invasion <laughs> Beatles things and, you know, just... So, Bianca's singing soul music and Richard is singing British Invasion stuff and they're going back and forth and the people are going crazy. Uh, you know, there, it wasn't packed, but there were several people who had been singing themselves and they all sat down and there was a DJ who came up to us and said, where are you from? <laughs> And he kept, he kept trying to get Bianca to sing duets with him, you know. Um, she graciously kind of bowed out, but... <coughs> um, we stayed a couple of hours and never went more than 10 minutes without one of them singing some perfect cover of a well-known song or other. I don't know about Richard. I think he sang in several groups and had done some musical theater. Bianca eventually told us that she had an eye who was a professional opera star in Paris. And she herself had studied voice and had leads in several musicals. Um, and not long after, and I stayed, I have stayed in touch with Bianca. Um, she sang caribbean, uh, cabarets uh, in, in bars and clubs in New York and so forth, and has been in uh, all kinds of, of shows. Um, as I said, the DJ kept trying to do duets with Bianca. She's, and that's all right. Before I share any more anecdotes, are there any questions? Anybody have any questions about either the film or anything that I went over? Go. Did Samuel ever come back? No, not to Hebrew. He came back to the United States. He was trying to get a bishopship. I'm not saying that right. He was trying to become a bishop, and in order to, he had to be appointed and so forth. But he, he was in Vermont. He was in. Uh, he went out west. He was in, uh, uh, I think, Wisconsin. I mean, he was all over the place. And, and then he was trying to get money because he felt that the government owed money. He was in Washington D.C. He was. Um, one fellow wrote a, uh, a Ph.D. thesis. <coughs> Dissertation. Um, uh, Samuel Peters said uh, he was a lesser figure of the colonial and revolutionary period, but he knew all the big shots. <laughs> you know, he talked to Franklin, and he, <coughs> he he was a mortal enemy of Jonathan Trump, the, the governor from Connecticut. You know, the, pretty much spent most of his time in Lebanon. Um, and it was Trumbull's, I think his brother and one of, at least one of his sons, who were kind of the organizers to the Sons of Liberty who came and roused him. So, um, didn't get along too well with them. But he, he refused to come back to New York, uh, to come back to Hebrew. Died something of a pauper in New York. And his nephew, uh, who had become, uh, he was governor of Connecticut, had tried to talk him into coming back to Hebrew, and he would not. But he is, his nephew did bring his body back to have him buried in Hebrew. So he's in, he's in St. Peter's Cemetery. Other questions?
question. Yes. So was the were the next thing you're talking about was the Nathaniel Man? No, 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 no. What Samuel Peter's him? nephew. Samuel Peter's oh. nephew became became governor. And another. Well, Nathaniel sure. Mann was also his nephew. Well, that's what I thought. Like yes. Yes. Son. Yes, he was. Right. Yes. And another relative, and I'm not sure. Check with my historian. Um, it may have been a great nephew became superintendent of schools in New Orleans and was beloved and did all kinds of, made all kinds of wonderful changes to the way children were taught in New Orleans. Um, and born and raised in Hebrew. So, other so, questions? So, just to follow up with my question. So, yes. did Nathaniel Mann, did he have to suffer any consequences when he was arrested? Did they, did they punish him? Not to my knowledge. And that may have been poetic license. Uh, he was. We know that he was trying to to get in the way, and that he had facilitated the sale, and so he probably stood to lose a few bucks. Uh, later, Caesar sued him, uh, claiming that he had been um, injured in the trip to Norwich and, and made his life very miserable. Uh, he did not win that lawsuit, but uh, he did so. Question? Do, so we know if Caesar and his family did they have staying in Hebron for the rest of their time? Or? Caesar, uh, not really. Um, he 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 moved around a little bit, and then Lois died, and Caesar remarried. And he, I believe, he was in Colchester for a while, and he was in Coventry, and um, eventually. Eventually, yes, eventually he did come back to Hebrew, um, and, and we think he perhaps had a home on Wall Street. Um, when we showed the film, there were some 50 relatives of Caesar that, that came to the film. They had a reunion in town several years before, and somehow connected with the historical society, I believe. And that was just from, they traced their ancestors back to one of his, one of his daughters, I believe. And then they were starting to kind of find out about others. And I don't, and we still kind of get inquiries, don't we, from? Two fairly recently, yes. From, from the family. S Caesar's relatives, so. Uh, Descendants, which is kind of cool, but they were there were like fifty of them. They all got up on stage afterwards and got a, got their pictures taken. They were they were just delightful. <coughs> Very cool to have them there. Other questions? All right. Well, I promised a couple. And Bianca had this really kind of fancy dress on. I don't know how much you do. Could really tell, but it was it fit her perfectly. They got it from Goodspeed, and uh, Goodspeed was very good with his costume lines. We got several costumes from Goodspeed, and we had a shoot. One of the uh, the scene with the wagon and the, when they're in the wagon, <coughs> um, that was done at uh, in Bolton at the the original owner or the founder of Country Carpenters home in Bolton. He had a big field and somebody contacted him and he said, yeah, you could, you have enough, we have enough room there. So um, this was, Roger is, the, is his son and this is, was Roger's father who has since passed away, but he granted his permission. So a whole bunch went there. Now, Ethan um, and I did not, were not in that scene. So we had the day free. We went to the beach and, you know, we had a good time. And, came back and, and just decided we'd go on a set and see how they were doing. And as typical, they were behind. And we looked as we were driving, we were just about pulling into the driveway, and this thunder cloud was like right over us. And they hadn't shot anything yet. They were set up to shoot the first scene, and thunder, lightning, wind, I mean, it was just everybody ran for cover. <coughs> and then they came out again, an hour later, a half hour later, 
and set up again, and then it happened again. So, you know, it's like, oh man. And then, now there's horses and a wagon. You get it out in the field, and, um, you know, it was all a little dicey. The horses were pretty cool with the lightning, but not that cool. And, well, so finally, they get to shoot the scene. And, you know, they run the horses and they, and they put the stuff in the wagon, and the wagon goes, and Bianca puts stuff in, and they go, okay, cut, uh, let's try it again. And, you know, so they had to, the horses had to go way down and turn around and come back and, and just set the lights up and the camera and so forth. And, you know, half an hour later, they do it again. And of course, <coughs> excuse me, the grass is kind of wet and slick because it had rained. So, after, I think, the third time, Bianca goes down in this, this dress that was very valuable, worth more than $1,000, so I'm told. And she falls, she slips in the wet, and slips into a pile of horse poop. And the costume lady, like, turns ashy. <laughs> what did you do? And they all run over and they're all scraping horse poop off of their dress. And also in that scene, I, I had recruited that. You know, I was close with Donna, and you know, it was like, what do you need? What can I help you with? Can, you know, I found a site when they where they could shoot a scene. I, uh, you know, Ethan stayed at my house. I, uh, I wrote the curriculum guide, which was later. But <coughs> excuse me. But they needed. A, they said they wanted a couple of kids, a couple of boys. And they wanted the boys to like run after the wagon after Bianca had done her little bit. They, the wagon went further, and then these two boys went running up behind the wagon and put something in the wagon. It's kind of a cool scene. And they had to shoot that several times. Again, the horses had to come back. And, and it was the field looked really cool because it had rained, and now it was, it was still really hot, and so there was some mist coming off the field. And I, I remember that the head camera guy was talking to Matt, and he was going, ah, this is the best thing I've ever shot. This is so cool. <laughs> and the two kids, one of them was a sixth grader, and the other was a seventh grader. And I knew them both, I knew their families, and I had recruited them. And dressed them with stuff out of the basement of the Hebrew Elementary School that, that they used for the medieval fair. And <laughs> so I was, you know, I was, I was watching them do their thing and thinking, this is great. This is... And then when I heard the cameraman go, oh, this is great. Well, you know, then we have the premiere. You show the thing. They're not it. Uh -huh. <laughs> they ended up, as they say, on the cutting room floor. It was, it was really too bad. I'll share one more and then let everybody get something to eat. Uh, Richard. Mays, Caesar. And when we were in the, in the church, we rehearsed the courtroom scene. First, we rehearsed it with just the leads. And then we brought in the extras that filled the pews to observe. And we rehearsed it a couple more times to get everybody looking in the right way, making the right sounds, and so forth. And I'm blind as a bat. When I take my glasses off now, I cannot make out faces of males or females. That's how blind I am. So I was about this far away from, from Richard. And you know, he was in the front row. So we're, we're rehearsing. And I'm just kind of moving my head. He's saying something, I'm moving my head. And she says something, I'm moving my head. And we rehearsed it a couple times, and then we took a break. And he comes up to me and he says, Oh man, thank you so much. I said, What? He said, Well, I just didn't know how to play this scene. I just didn't know what I, you know, I was having trouble with it. And when you and I made eye contact, <laughs> I knew exactly what I got. I just got it. <laughs> I said, well, I, I was going for that. <laughs> so, 
Yeah, it's gone. I couldn't see his, tell his eyes from his nose. <laughs> Well, this is the curriculum binder that uh, was distributed to all the high schools, not just about every high school and middle school in the state of Connecticut, and a lot of the elementary schools. Are there any teachers here tonight? Would you like a binder? I would love it. The binder is a curriculum guide, and it includes a... Uh, a copy of the DVD. Where do you teach? Barbara. Lovely. But there's one in the school, honest. I'm sure there is. Somewhere. But having been there. It's not actually in our curriculum right now. But <laughs> <laughs> we'll find a way. Yeah. Okay. Chris, she raised her hand Chris, too. Yes, I thought I thought. I'm going to tell you that I have a dose of anthropology, but I don't think I'm going to stop you like that. Mm. You know, I know it may have gone there. They oh, may, okay. But let's. I can't be sure. Um, I know it went to Mystic, uh -huh. um, and there were several other, you know, non-schools that we, we sent them out to. Um, I went to Amistad out of the Wadsworth Academy. Yeah, the Amistad Academy. Yeah, the Amistad Academy. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yes, the center. Yes, yes. Wadsworth. I think that would be something they would continue. Possibly, we've got oh. we've got about we've got about three or four dozen of them, <laughs> and well, you know, there were like a thousand that were printed up and sent out, and, and you know, and some schools, some school in Norwalk said back and said, send us more. They, they took ten more, so uh, so that's it's available. And I will give you one, especially if you. Become a member, which costs teachers, <laughs> which costs teachers nothing. <laughs> Just there. There's a, there are membership applications back there, and it really it's it's not a lot. We don't ask much of you, but it would be great if you were a member. So, thank you for coming, and much appreciated.